Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, so, hi, uh, I'm Chris. Um, my job title is semi-professional nerd um, because sometimes I work and I'm a nerd. Um, so I'm here to talk about writing web-based services with an emphasis on not making things suck for people who are writing mobile applications. And the direction from which I'm, I'm coming to this talk is that I've been working on some mobile applications of late. Um, and basically everything that I've had to work on in the past year has had to interface with a website or a, a web API in some, in some sort of fashion. Sometimes this has been a really, really good experience for me. Uh, write, writing apps that use um, web services is really, really easy. And sometimes it's been utterly painful and dreadful and something that I would never want to do again. Um, so basically what I'm hoping to uh, impart during this talk are some ideas for people who are going to uh, design mobile web, uh, sorry, web services for mobile applications, or mobile designers who need to influence the design of an API in the hope that things might not suck so much for you when you go out and develop your own apps. Um, and there's one idea that I really want to impart from this talk, and that is that your infrastructure is absolutely dreadful. Mobile networks these days aren't all that great, and they seem to be getting worse. So hopefully the techniques that I, uh, that I impart uh, will give you some ideas about how to work around these shortcomings of mobile networks and designing for mobile, um, mobile devices. So basically, it's, it's a list of random thoughts, uh, requests for designers, and ideas that I've had. Um, some of these I came up with off the top of my head based on ideas that I just thought would be cool if somebody went and actually implemented them. I don't guarantee that everything makes sense, uh, so pick and choose ideas that work for you, basically. Um, there's also a lot of opinion in this talk, um, and I guarantee that at least something in this talk will be wrong, so uh, feel free to try and spot it at some stage. Okay, so with that in mind, let's you know, start the talk proper and we will start by discussing networks. Um, hopefully most fixed networks that you work on aren't going to look as bad as those ones. Um, right. We as developers tend to work with networks that are pretty good. Um, you know, the quality that we have though, um, now that we're making the trans transition to mobile, has basically lulled us into a false sense of security with false expectations of what we can get from a mobile-based network. And to give you some sort of idea of what I mean, um, you probably write applications on something that looks like this, or maybe something with a slightly smaller form factor like a MacBook or something like that. Um, and your devices will be connected to something that looks like this, some gigabit ethernet network with, via a really, really short cable so you don't get signal loss or they don't get chopped up. Um, and that's probably connected to a highly reliable broadband internet connection. Uh, if you're slightly less lucky, you might have a local uh, wireless network, um, and that's still going to be connected to the same highly reliable broadband network. Um, now, as developers, this is actually a really, really bad idea, because these networks are ideal. Um, they rarely disappear, our links rarely go down, and things like packet loss and connection dropping are almost non-existent, and they're usually predictable when they do happen. Um, the vast majority of APIs that are out there are built with this assumption in mind, that you're going to be working on a highly reliable network. But the truth is that ideal mobile networks don't actually exist. Um, and coupled with that, we have highly unreliable users who go off and do really, really weird things with their devices. And so you get the combination of unreliable networks and really, really erratic users and, users, and this generates massive avenues for failure um, as developers. You know, users go out and they put themselves inside Faraday cages um, so they can't actually receive any connections. Um, users use their devices on trains um, and put themselves you know, on black spots in public transport or crowded places like the city center because mobile networks never work where there are people, obviously. Uh, or they just voluntarily put themselves on a really, really bad network. <laughs> so you get the idea. Mobile networks really, really suck. And mobile networks, as designed, can't, design, uh, can't deal with the situations that we're putting them through at the moment. Um, 
And the problem is that we as mobile users um, like to have our mobile devices talk through the cloud to some sort of service. Um, and for this particular reason, you know, because we don't have anything better than the mobile networks that our users are working on, um, our apps need to work with the infrastructure that we've been given. So basically what this talk is going to be about is looking at things from the service design point of view to ensure that our APIs can help and not hinder mobile application developers. And this talk will consist of three parts. The first is to try and understand the characteristics of mobile networks as they exist. The second is to look at techniques that you can apply when designing mobile APIs um, that can work in the face of network failure. And the third is to design to be useful from, um, you know, to design your API so that it's actually useful for the purposes in which you're using it. And these three things put together will hopefully result in you having an API that does not suck. Right, so we're all sitting comfortably. Good. So part one, to design an API for a mobile network, you must first understand how mobile networks work. Mobile networks are inherently different to fixed networks for various reasons. This is an example of a mobile phone. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, this is a Nokia 5110. It was released in the late 1990s, and it was the most popular phone of its era. Uh, this will still work on any mobile network in Australia, provided you can find a working, um, working version of the phone. And the networks that this phone was designed for st uh, still operate as the basis for all the networks that exist today in Australia, the GSM model. Um, and this phone, it, it had three important features as far as I could tell. The first was to operate as a telephone. The second was to be able to send and receive text messages. And it had a killer feature in the form of you know, the first real mobile app, the game Snake. Um, and yes, it, it was good and I enjoyed it and I wasted far too much time playing it in my formative years. Uh, anyway, to support these sorts of features, uh, a mobile network will need to provide a bare minimum um, feature set. So what do you need to be able to make and receive calls on a mobile network? Well, as it turns out, not all that much. You just need to be able to provide 12.2 kilobits per second in either direction to make a voice call. Um, and the transmission protocol for, vo uh, for voice calls is best effort. This is because you, know, you can drop tiny bits of audio information and still have the person on the other end of the call have a vague idea of what you're saying what you're saying. Um, humans are also really, really good at exponential back off. If they don't know that you received a message, they'll gladly repeat themselves until you understand what it, what it was they were saying. That is to say that they will completely repeat themselves very, very frequently until you understand what they're saying. Um, <laughs> and then we have SMSs. Um, and they also require not that much bandwidth. Um, you know, you just need to be able to send 160 bytes on the back channels of a network. Um, and this protocol is also best effort because you, know, you don't need a read receipt because you can't possibly send anything useful in 160 characters or less, can you? Um, and so at the same time as this phone came into existence and mobile networks were being designed for you know, massively scalable best effort communications, uh, we had the internet appear uh, on desktop machines. Um, in more advanced countries, um, you might be seeing the first high-speed cable networks going in. Uh, for other people like us, we were getting you know, quite reliable dial-up broadband, outside dial-up modem connections. Um, and millions and millions of 13-year-olds were getting exposed to their first, um, their first chance of web design through things like GeoCities and such. Um, and they did their development on things like this. Um, their experience of the, of the internet would be on a PC of some description. And as it would turn out, uh, our experiences of the internet would not change at all. We might go from something like this to you know, a laptop or something like that, um, and you know, connect via a Wi-Fi network instead of via a dial-up modem. But the sorts of applications that we would consume via the internet did not change. And we still used highly reliable networks to connect to the internet. The problem is that some random device uh, popped up a few years ago and suddenly mobile networks got completely swamped with people trying to access mobile internet. And you know, 
nowadays, a large proportion of people's interaction with the internet happens on mobile devices. The problem is that when people are thinking about designing for the internet, they have this antiquated point of view um, that they design for networks that are highly reliable because these are the networks that they grew up with and these are the assumptions that they have. And they carry over the same design principles for mobile networks. Um, and this sort of approach very, very rarely works. And it might be educational to investigate why this is the case. So the internet application stack, oh god, that looks bad. Um, apologies, the projector in here is really, really awful. Um, so our standard internet stack has two protocols in the middle. One is called TCP and one is called IP. So IP, or Internet Protocol, is a best effort transmission protocol. And when combined with TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, you get guarantees of quality of service. Um, so if, if, bits of a, uh, sorry, if, if parts of a message are not received, TCP ensures that they'll get resent until they are received. And this makes a best effort network like IP work quite well. And it works quite well because we have highly reliable data link layers on our networks. So we have things like uh, Ethernet or uh, cable modems or Wi-Fi. They're all really, really reliable and tend to work all the time. So we get these, uh, so we get these assumptions or, or expectations out of networks when we deal with them. Firstly, everything usually works. Secondly, if an error occurs, it's going to be because somebody's cut your cable in half or a server's gone down, or something absolutely catastrophic. And these sorts of errors, which almost always cause failure, are highly infrequent. So what's different between these sorts of networks and the mobile networks that we deal with today? Well, I'll just highlight a couple of things to give you an idea. We have a best effort protocol for transmitting our data and we use highly reliable networks. But on mobile, what we have are 3G cellular, cellular networks, and these are designed as best effort networks. And what this means is that things can work sometimes, but errors are a lot more frequent, but rarely fatal. They're things like saying that your network is down but might pop back up later. And for this case, failure to get data transmitted is very, very frequent on mobile devices. So I imagine it's clear to everyone in this room that internet on mobile devices is not the same as internet on uh, fixed devices. But to the casual observer um, who isn't so interested in tech, um, they just see the internet as provided regardless of what form it comes in, in exactly the same way. And their usage patterns do not change. <laughs> so, our users expect things to be highly reliable, okay? They think that because they're being provided with the same sorts of things on their mobile device as they get on their computer, the behavior should be the same. And what our users see are our mobile applications. They don't see the network failing. <coughs> So where the, you know, the face of network failure to our users. And so that means that we're the blame, we get the blame when things go wrong. So you want to go about asking for something on the internet. And so how does that work in a nutshell? Well, you sort of have three phases. And once again, I apologize for the color scheme. Um, so in an ideal world, we try to negotiate a connection from our server. We then request data from it and then we receive a response. Um, in some protocols, the same connection can be reused frequently. This is useful because it saves on making extra new connections. Um, as it turns out, making a connection on a mobile device or on the internet is surprisingly difficult because we as users like to enter in things like domain names rather than IP addresses. And this means that you have to do things like DNS lookups and, and related things. And this can be repetitive and require a lot of extra connections to work. And so making a connection, why is my mouse not working? Uh, right, 
Making a connection involves lots and lots and lots of sockets. But as it turns out, making connections on 3G networks is designed to be very, very expensive. Once you have a connection, uh, it's easy to, make, uh, to request extra data from it, but making extra connections is expensive in 3G. So what this means is that we want to reduce the number of connections we create. Um, but we have a problem. People could be using a highly unreliable network and have no signal whatsoever. And if your apps are designed to keep connections open rather than, um, rather than creating new ones, well then they're going to stop working after a while and they're going to fail quite badly. So the objective that you'd like to keep in mind there is to keep your connections as short-lived as possible so that um, you get all the data you need from a connection uh, and then you don't care if it's failed. So this, in my opinion, is a conflict of interest. So we now know that the life of a mobile designer is one of trade-offs. Designing an API that makes a mobile application happy is a matter of exploiting these trade-offs. So the primary goal of a mobile API is to be able to get information from a mobile service and display that in a coherent fashion. The problem that I've established is that mobile networks don't guarantee that data will reach you on the first request or even at all. So planning to make APIs that work for mobile devices is a matter of planning for your API to fail. And what I'm going to do now is go over a bunch of design techniques that may or may not work that will hopefully, um, that will hopefully increase your API or web services tolerance to failure. The first technique is to make everything static. <laughs> Serving static content is a solved problem. This is because HTTP was designed with the intention of serving linked documents. And the design of HTTP was, so that, was to make sure that documents could be trivially cached on, um, on remote clients or remote servers in the case of faulty connections and to reduce bandwidth. So what this means is that you should try and make your dynamically served data appear to be static. Um, and this is a problem because people who go about designing web servers or services very, very frequently make a point of serving up dynamic information or serving up information dynamically, even when they're sending up records that represent database entries that haven't changed in years. And this is an absolute waste. If the data that you're sending is not likely to change, then take advantage of HTTP and tell the clients. So this here is a standard HTTP response. Uh, it's saying that, um, that there is a document here and it's been found. And it contains a whole bunch of headers. And they identify various parts of the, um, of the response that's being sent by a web server. Um, the most important ones to the point that I'm trying to make here are these two, the last modified header and the expires header. Um, if you have a last modified header present, then an HTTP client can tell whether, the, whether or not the data has changed since the last time it requested it. If you make this header appear, um, then a client does not need to download, um, download that, um, the stuff from that URL again. And if an expires header is present, then a client can avoid having to re-download a request if it, knows that the, um, if it knows that the data is unlikely to have changed. And HTTP caches are pretty much universal. They exist on, every, uh, on basically every HTTP library that's out there. And they can be, you know, and writing your services can, um, can take advantage of HTTP caches uh, exceedingly trivially, trivially. So the problem is, what if you have uh, data that is inherently uncacheable? These are things that change frequently, like timelines and such. Uh, the trick is to ensure that once you've made a request, a response can be trivially replayed until it's no longer needed. And now I'm going to drop that idea entirely and talk about REST, because REST is cool. Um, so what is REST? REST is pretty URLs, right? You agree? Pretty URLs is REST? Oh, good. Okay. No, it's not. REST is not about pretty URLs. REST is absolutely not about pretty URLs. REST is a design, um, 
is a design uh, philosophy for mobile, or sorry, for web services in general, where you focus on the idea of resources. And there are four basic, or sorry, three basic ideas that you, um, that you deal with when making services that use REST. Uh, the first is that you give all your resources a sensible identifier, a URL which may or may not be pretty. You make sure that these resources change uh, very, very infrequently, and you make good use of the semantics of HTTP. Now, you should use REST well wherever possible. So, when going back to the idea of caching, um, what if you were to let your URLs specify a specific response that has been served up by a web server? So, if you have a particular URL that generates something that frequently changes, do a temporary redirect to a specific response, something like this. And you can cache this response in some sort of, uh, in some sort of memory cache like memcache or something like that, and use the URL as the cache key. And what this means is that the responses that your web server make are now a resource that can be repeatedly accessed by clients. And this means that you can use HTTP 206 responses. And if you don't know what they are, these are bits that let you resume downloads. So if you're downloading something reasonably big, like say on a mobile network, more than 100K is pretty big, um, then you can make it so that your responses are resumable. So you can jump in halfway through a response and get the rest of it if your connection fails. This is cool. It means that you can, um, it means that your server doesn't have to do as much work, and it means that if you are getting frequent connection drops, you don't have to go back to the start of a response whenever you go to download, uh, whenever you go to uh, request it. So yeah, resumable requests, really, really useful. Very few APIs do it. Um, so yeah, as a footnote, if you are going to write an API that does this, uh, document it. Make your clients be, make the developers of clients for your service be aware of the fact that you support resumable requests because it's pretty trivial to add into client code. Okay, next, make everything repeatable. If your API is highly dynamic, then it's really important that you make your requests repeatable. Um, because it's really important that, uh, that a mobile app and the service with which it's communicating remains synchronized. And it's far too easy to implement a service that can get ahead of itself. So what I'm thinking of in this case are time-based services um, you know, with an event-driven type API. Um, for example, things that track movement on a map or things that deal with sending of messages or something like that. You know, things where events that you request change over time. Um, so one way that people, no, so a, a way that you might go about designing such an API is to make a URL called events. And you request events in a given context, and it serves up the latest re, uh, set of events that you've request, uh, requested. So you get the first one, it sends the first five. You get the second one, it sends the, uh, the next five. And you get the next one, it serves the next one. The problem is, what if your connection crashes halfway through one of your requests? Well. Uh, suddenly, your app doesn't know about the events that have come through in the second request that you've made. And it's very, very easy to write something like a PHP app, for example, that brazenly makes changes to your database, uh, even if a connection uh, fails halfway through, because they don't use transactions or something like that, because developers are dumb. Um, so the rule that you must... Um, that you must know in this case, when you're developing for mobile and your mobile apps are talking over the network, only your app will know the state that it is in. And it's very, very important when designing an API that you exploit this fact. Because if you don't, the app that you're developing just ends up being inconsistent. And if your app has inconsistent data, then it's completely not worth using to your users because it's not showing stuff that's correct, and you want your apps to actually be useful and tell you correct things. So one trick that you can use is to make sure that your app can repeatedly serve up events, even ones that it thinks it has already sent. You can use caching or something like that um, to, uh, to you know, store events that you've previously served up and generated. And basically, the easiest way to do this is just by adding a since parameter to your URLs. So your client can ask for old events if it wants them. And then suddenly, if your connection crashes, 
you can guarantee consistency. So if you want bonus points for something like this, use something like, um, you can use uh, partial data. So even if your connection drops halfway through, being able to make use of the information that's already come through. And you can do this by doing something like the caching idea that I showed earlier, or you can present your responses in a way that's amenable to incremental parsing, which means I need to go off on another tangent and talk about data encapsulation. Uh, who here knows about XML? XML? Who here likes XML? Awesome, you can tell me about it later. Um, so yeah, XML was you know, the first, uh, first real uh, attempt at making a data interchange format that lets you store arbitrary data structures. Um, the thing is, it's really big, it's really bloated, and it's not particularly good to read if you're a human, and it got used in far too many inappropriate places, and we're still dealing with the side effects of this. Um, more recently, we had this thing called JSON come along, and JSON can repeat, oh, sorry, replace XML in a lot of situations. And JSON is cool because it's lightweight, which means you don't have much bandwidth overhead when you send it. That's great on mobile devices. It's really easy for humans to read, uh, and it maps well to the standard um, data structures that we use in all manner of development. You know, it relates directly to dictionaries and arrays, and you can represent basically any data structure easily using those. So yeah, JSON is really, 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 really good. Who here agrees with me? Yes, yes, JSON is great, but it does not replace XML. It's not, well, it's not a one-to-one -one replacement, and I'll explain why. This is a tree. You should be familiar with trees. And here is the JSON representation of that tree. Um, yeah, it's basically just a set of nested objects, and the JSON can produce exactly the same representation semantically as I showed earlier. Now, XML will store it slightly differently. It stores it like that. So you basically have a bunch of ordered linked lists instead of, uh, in some, instead of something that's arbitrarily nested with objects um, that are exactly the same length. But the thing that you get here is that there is an inherent order on XML things, and you can guarantee this by writing schemas. So the problem is with JSON, say you have a an object that looks like that, that's exactly the same object in JSON. Right? So if you want to do something like incremental parsing, well, you need to know what your data is going to look like when, it's get, when it gets sent through. Um, with, say, HTML, if you have half a document loaded, your web browser can actually do a pretty good job of displaying that. And this was really, really useful in the 90s when we didn't have much bandwidth. You could just show parts of a document as it was coming through, and your user would scroll down through it while it was reading and hopefully load up the rest of the page. Um, the problem is that every, not every data format is amenable to being parsed incrementally. So here's a complete JSON object, and if you just send that, well, you can't guarantee what your object is going to look like. It's completely and utterly meaningless. But with XML, if you only get part of it, you still have something that's completely valid to parse, and that's cool. Um, as an aside, you can probably think um, you, could, you could encapsulate your JSON objects in lists and use a custom parser, um, but lists are really, really uh, unexpressive, and expressiveness in, in uh, JSON is highly valued. Um, so yeah, it's not something that you should really go about looking. Incremental parsing in XML is good and can be done easily. That said, most of the cases where you want to use incremental parsing XML isn't that great at either, because normally you're sending things in record-oriented format, you know, where you send the same data structure, and it's a really simple one over and over and over again. Um, so in these sorts of cases, you should use record-oriented data formats. And record-oriented data formats are really, really trivial to parse incrementally, and they're really easy to conceptualize. And what's an example of, an, of a record-oriented data format? No ideas? CSV, yes, exactly. So yeah, CSV, it's really, really easy to parse. There are libraries for it for basically everything, and if there isn't one on your, on your platform, it's easy to write one yourself. So yeah, CSV, it's cool. Um, so yeah, um, basically, 
If your data structures are complex or nested, then using something like CSV is probably not all that sensible. But if you know your schema and it can make an, and you have really simple flat data structures, then sending CSV is possibly a really, really good thing to do. And it's great because you can parse it incrementally and just throw off objects as they, um, as they get received. So you can actually implement a simple streaming API. And that means that you can do something like this. So say our connection crashes halfway through our second request again. Well, our client has already received events six and seven, which means it can start at eight, which means that we don't need to send down repetitive data again. And that seems pretty sensible to me. Cool? Right, so the next thing that you should do is keep your responses as small as possible. And to, do, or, and to give you an example of why it's a good idea to keep your responses as small as possible, I'm going to provide you with a counterexample. And that counterexample comes from Twitter. So what would you expect to receive if you were to ask to get a single tweet from Twitter's JSON API? Probably a bit of text and not much else. You know, 140 characters, right? There you go. That is a single tweet from the Twitter API and there's 140 characters worth of text. That's 3,396 bytes. Fairness, you asked for it. Uh, no, I didn't. The entities, the entities is actually quite small. Twitter does have like a yeah. small... Anyway. <laughs> yes, there is a way to make it smaller. I did, I did exaggerate this. This is 2,400% two, 2, over, overhead. And that's just a tiny bit bloated, if you ask me. Um, even if you didn't ask for the entities, well, there's where most of the d extra data comes from. That's actually sufficient data to completely replicate a user's profile page. And you've just requested a single tweet. This is something you could probably ask for in a second API call, because this is actually going to get sent over and over and over again um, if you ask for a timeline. Yeah, that's basically all they're trying to do. Make it so that Twitter can load that page in one API call internally. Um, so yeah, please don't be this bad. And so after you keep your request small, or your, your responses small, the next thing you should aim to do is to minimize the requests that you make. Um, the reason why is because the number one source of lag when you're communicating with mobile networks is in initiating requests. Therefore, if you keep the number of requests down, um, your app will appear to be faster. So what this means is that you should provide more data than is absolutely necessary. And I'm going to provide you with a good example from the real world for that, and that comes from Twitter. And so yes, uh, here's our 3.3 killer character um, JSON, JSON dump from Twitter, and there's our 140 characters worth of text. Now as it turns out, there is actually some useful information stored in that. Um, there's some data which tells us about the users that are mentioned in it, so that you can attach um, attach IDs of users to tweets and, um, and easily, make re uh, easily make extra requests if needs be. Um, there's some information about the user, also about the tweet that's being replied to, um, so that you can uh, link up a conversation view and link, and link back so you have context. And there's some information that you can use to display information about the user who originated a tweet. So yeah, there's heaps and heaps of useful information in there, but Twitter have gone and been completely, um, uh, completely unselective about what sort of information they're showing to people, and the vast majority of clients don't use more than 20% of the information that gets sent down in those sorts of requests. So yes, um, provide extra information when necessary so that, you, um, so that you minimize the number of requests that you make, but do try to keep res responses small at the same time. When you're designing an API, you should always be planning for the future. Um, new features can get added to APIs. Ones that don't make sense can get removed. Um, but remember that app application failures are just as bad as service failures. Uh, if your API changes in an unexpected way to an app, it takes a very, very long time for you to be able to fix that on the app side because you have the whole approval process uh, on iOS. And that means that you can't push out fixes instantaneously. 
This means that your apps should continue to work even if you decide to change your API. And what this means is that you need to provide versions. If you publish a version of your API, you should try as hard as possible to keep old versions of it existing at the same time. And you should do this from the start of your development. Um, if you are influencing the design of an API, make sure that your API developers include a versioning scheme in it and make that trivially accessible. The reason for this is that you can break backwards compatibility easily and old unupdated apps can still work. Your, app, your application updates can't get pushed to users instantaneously and your users are highly unlikely to update their apps as soon as they come out anyway. There can be a lag of months before your users can be using your latest features. So there are ways to go about uh, versioning your APIs. And there are two ways that I think, uh, I think make sense. The first one is instead of using URLs that look like the one at the top, um, use URLs that look like the one at the bottom. There is a version component to the URL. So that you're explicitly re uh, requesting a specific version of the API. The other one, uh, uh, I've lost my mouse again. Right, the other one is to make use of HTTP headers. Um, something that people don't know about the content type header in HTTP is that you can do this. You can add your own custom suffix to the end of a content type. So if your API is sending down JSON, or your, um, your user is requesting JSON, you can say this is JSON that is representing data coming from this particular API, um, which makes sense as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, URLs or custom content types, do one of the two of them, and that will mean that if your API does change, you can still continue serving up the old one and have it still work for old apps. The final type of failure you should plan for is user failure. Uh, good luck with that. So the final part of my talk is dealing with ways to make APIs that are useful. You want to make sure that apps that consume your APIs can do exactly what they want and that they can do it in an easy fashion. And the first thing that I want to talk about is authentication. So if it's not absolutely clear to you, Storing username and password combinations on a mobile device is as bad as putting a post-it note containing a password on a monitor. This is an absolutely dreadful thing that you can do because if your mobile, so if your password is stored on a device, that device is going places with people. And users are dumb. They lose their phones and users reuse their passwords no matter how many times you tell them not to. And this eventually leads to users being able to access every single piece of important uh, information about the user just because they happen to pick up a stray iPhone. Um, possibly a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the idea. So there is a solution to this problem. You can authenticate without storing, um, without storing usernames and passwords on a device. And the solution that people tend to use these days is called OAuth. And uh, Nick gave a really good talk about how to use OAuth in iOS applications earlier. Um, so this is a situation that OAuth is designed to solve. There are many possible clients, and these might not be trusted by the, um, by the service that lets these clients exist. Twitter is a perfect example for it. You request an OAuth key, and you'll get it within a second, right? So clients aren't necessarily trusted. Um, we want users to be able to use multiple clients without storing their credentials in, the, in these clients. And we want to ensure that requests that are made from a client do originate from that client indeed. And sorry about the color scheme again. Um, so yeah, say that we have a whole bunch of applications. We've got three of them here. We've got a couple of users and we've got a service at the top. What OAuth lets you do is it lets users revoke apps if they lose their phone or if they decide an app is being malicious, uh, they can revoke it. Um, or if a connection, um, oh, sorry. Or, um, or if a service discovers that an app is being malicious, it means that it can, revoke, um, it can revoke the access of a given client to using an API. Um, and this is convenient. The trade-off that you get from OAuth, though, um, 
is basically a confusing login flow. Um, OAuth is kind of difficult to implement at the best of times. And the problem is that for the vast majority of services out there, systems like OAuth are complete overkill. Why is that? Well, let's look at the use case for OAuth again. Um, let's say that we're designing an API for internal use only. So this means that we completely trust every app that is going to access our service. Well, that means that we don't have a problem with this third case. So the only one that we really want to solve is the second one, being able to use multiple clients without, um, without storing our credentials on a device. So basically, OAuth is a specific solution to a specific problem. And this problem is not one that the vast majority of API designers have. Um, they just tend to use OAuth in their own systems because Twitter and Facebook do. And using something because somebody much bigger than you with different problems to you, um, you know, just using it for that reason is not a valid reason for you to use it and generally results in you making really, really bad systems and demonstrates that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I've thought about these sorts of things. I was wondering whether or not you could do something custom that solves this problem. And I had the answer pointed out to me. Um, if you have... HTTP actually has pretty good support for authentication built in. So if you have a way of generating tokens that you can provide to a client, you, all you need is a way of generating these, and then you can authenticate just using these tokens as usernames and passwords with HTTP basic authentication. Uh, this seems like a pretty simple, way, simple thing to implement as far as I'm concerned. And I've actually seen this implemented by a couple of guys from Canonical. Um, you can check out on their, uh, check out their Launchpad repositories, those two projects, if you're interested in seeing something that actually implements that. So yeah, there are ways to solve the problems that you, as, uh, you particularly have that, um, that OAuth can solve. But the chances are that you, as a service designer, don't have the specific problems that OAuth is designed to solve. And so don't bother with OAuth in most cases. So the next thing you want to do is make sure that your API provides good replication. Your APIs should be able to trivially allow um, functionality of other applications that you produce. Um, they, sh they should be replicatable. And it should be really, really trivial to replicate this information on a mobile app. The trick is to expose everything. If you have functionality, make an API call for it, or add the functionality to an existing call. So make sure that you design your APIs in tandem with the first application that you're developing, mobile or not, or your website, or everything else you design, or you know, anything. Make sure your API is designed in tandem with the functionality you're trying to provide. And the best way to do this is to make sure that the people producing the applications use the API as their only way of getting information. If your web server is making, so if your web application is making database calls instead of making API calls, then it means that there is something that cannot be done on your API. Your web service should be able to do everything it needs to via an API. And if you do that, then by the time that your, um, your mobile application comes to be developed, they'll be able to do that, right? Cool. So make sure that web apps use your API as well, even if they have direct access to the database. Next, always consider the way that you present your data to your clients. Um, as it turns out, XML and JSON are pretty damn similar. They can send the same sort of data structures. And it's very, very easy to make an API that can serve both. Twitter is a great example. There is an XML API, there is a JSON API, and they provide exactly the same functionality because the API calls are identical. Um, and another be uh, added benefit to this is that if your app supports XML and you have a pointy-haired boss, you can say, hey, we have an XML-compliant API. They hear a buzzword, and they'll approve your use of it. Cool. And no discussion of web services can be complete without discussing SOAP. And no discussion of web services can be complete without telling you not to use SOAP ever. OK? Um, SOAP is bad if only because it ties you into using XML. And it ties you into using really, really verbose XML, which guarantees that your requests are going to be mammoth, which is something that you do not want on mobile devices. Um, 
and lock-in is a bad thing in general. Um, aside from that, the support for it on mobile devices is, as, is utterly atrocious. Um, Josh gave a really good lightning talk about this last year, where he demonstrated uh, his head, uh, how he banged his head against the wall while trying to implement a soap, um, a soap consumer on iOS. Um, if you have any control over API design, make sure that you do not use SOAP. There are better design uh, principles that you can apply, such as REST. Um, next, do not make your API replicate your database structure. APIs are meant to be useful for your developers, whereas a data model is meant to be useful for database engines to access. And most web developers are not database engines. Um, and the reason for this, um, why you would not want to do this, is because it's very, very difficult to make join calls in an API. Um, you store your data in a database in third normal form, so there's basically no redundancy whatsoever. But a bit of redundancy when making requests on mobile devices is really, really good because it allows you to minimize the requests you make of your service. So make sure that your APIs uh, rep uh, represent the sort of use cases that your apps are going to make. Um, send extra data that is not in a database table. Finally, uh, make excellent use of the semantics of the protocol that you're using. In, the most, in most cases, your API is going to be implemented over HTTP. So in this case, you should use HTTP correctly. HTTP, although it's 20 years old now, um, was actually really, really well designed. And it's a really, really expressive protocol. There are things that are built into HTTP, which if you implement them in your own API, you instantaneously have support on clients for. Things like, um, like redirection or, um, or, or description of the, uh, of the data you're, being, you're sending. Um, so for example, you can do things like using HTTP's method, um, method types in a sensible way. You have get methods which only extract data from a service. It doesn't change using put to create new things, using post to update things, using delete to delete things. You use these semantically, it's easy for a client to tell what a method is going, uh, what an API endpoint is going to do, right? Secondly, use these status codes in HTTP correctly. If you're redirecting, use, instead of using 301, which just says, this could be, this is a redirect of some description. Use one of the descriptive forms of redirects. Use a 307 if you're temporarily redirecting things and use a 303 if you're permanently redirecting things. These have different behaviors in uh, caches on a client level. If you supply a 303, then your device will never go looking at that URL again and, once, and that means you save connections. Right, because you don't have to dereference an APR, um, dereference a URL every time you go looking for it. So 303 means you get caching. Same with um, same with error codes. Instead of serving up 404s, which is just a temporary not found thing, use 410s. This means that your device will fail um, fail an, a URL call the moment it sees a URL, as opposed to having to go and make a connection to find out that something doesn't exist. And finally, you should always serve up 418 requests if your web service is being served from a teapot. It's an actual response code in HTTP. You should check the RFC. Nothing supports it from memory, though, correct? Uh, teapots do. None of the servers. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the end of my talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, Please give me some feedback at that URL. Uh, I really, really want to know what you thought about it. Uh, give me comments and give me ratings. Um, so yes, that's the end of the talk. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, are there any questions?